we look back over the past couple of years, we as individuals, families, churches, and nations have faced challenges that put us in places and predicaments that I bet many of us never dreamed that we would find ourselves in. As we look toward the future, we continue to recover from COVID and its wide-reaching effects economically, psychologically, emotionally, physically, and all the while we are enduring intense political and social unrest. These challenges have extended to the church in many ways as well. Many churches around the world, including our own, are struggling with getting people reconnected with the church on Sundays and plucked back into ministries that are essential. For instance, this past Sunday while I was on vacation, I found out that we didn't have one single child or youth in Sunday school. No one from zero to 18 years of age. Now that was an isolated event. I know that doesn't happen often, but it still alarms me. I mean, after all, I was on vacation as well, and I'm sure several others were, but even though I'm encouraged by seeing several back here this Sunday, for quite some time I've been in my heart concerned. And I'm reflecting on this also as a parent. You know, as parents, we are entrusted by God with our children for 18 short years. Many of you know how short they are. They go by just like that and we are called by God to be faithful stewards of them during that time and we get one shot we get one shot at it as I look back due to COVID concerns I know many of our young people and let's face it many of us as adults have already missed out on almost a year's worth of weekly discipleship and ministry opportunities But even now, as we have largely emerged from the pandemic, they are still many missing out a lot today. A lot of valuable opportunities to disciple ourselves as well as our children that we will never get back are being missed. And the scary thing is, is I really don't think many of us realize just how precious and important that time is not only for the health of our church but for the spiritual well-being of ourselves and our young people in a world that is increasingly complex and difficult to navigate my heart aches because we will never get these pivotal moments back to lay the foundation of christ and build own it by instilling key foundational biblical truths into our hearts they will need all of us will need this foundation to navigate the mixed messages that are pulling us and will continue to pull us in so many different directions as the enemy seeks to distract and deceive us Even as a young person, if you think about it, if a young person is present in church on Sundays for, we'll call it two hours, even though it's not technically two hours, for Sunday school and for worship, every week, 52 weeks out of the year, that still pales in comparison to the more than 100 hours that secular education, entertainment, and other factors, advertisement, media, and peers have each and every week. It takes supernatural intervention to help young people and adults discern truth from error even with that. Let alone two hours of gospel instruction once a month or less. Considering all of this, is it any wonder that we are facing the confusion and the chaos that we are in our society today? 
I say this not to shame or guilt trip anyone. I'm not that kind of a guy. But hopefully to encourage urgent reflection and prayer. And I say this not to be cliche. I am serious as I can be. I think the time for playing church and giving prayer lip service has passed. If we want to navigate the years ahead. The question is, how will we, as individuals, as a church, and others, respond? Our answer to that question depends largely upon whether or not God truly holds the place of supreme importance in our hearts and lives. It, it factors upon whether he holds supreme importance in our homes and in our churches as well. When Jesus was asked by the teacher of the law, what is the greatest commandment of all the commandments? You remember how he began his answer? He said at the beginning of his answer, the most important one is this, and he quotes from Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you know what comes after that, many of us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. Do we love God that passionately? Really? If not, who or what is holding us back? Who or what is keeping us from taking time to call out to God in genuine, fervent prayer in these desperate times? What, is, what or who is distracting us from keeping the main thing the main thing, as we often say? Thousands of years ago, God promised Abraham and Sarah a son. And that through that son, all nations on the earth would be blessed. But years and years went by, and the promise remained unfulfilled until one day God came to Abraham when he was 99, he said, guess what? You and Sarah are going to have that son. It would be through this son that God would fulfill his promise to Abraham to make his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. At 99 years old, Abraham fell face down laughing at the thought of him and Sarah having a child at such an old age. But nevertheless, when Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90, she gave birth to Isaac. His name means he laughs. Isaac was not only his father's pride and joy, he was the promised son through whom God would establish his everlasting covenant. Isaac was the son through whom God would carry on Abraham's legacy and family, which was extremely important in that culture back in then. Back then. Isaac was the son upon whom all the other promised blessings of God hinged. It is safe to say that a lot was riding upon Isaac's well-being for Abraham. And at this point in the story, we turn to Genesis 22. By this time, Isaac would have been at least a teenager, a young man, or even older. And here we find Abraham is about to face a test bigger than anything he could have ever imagined. An excruciating aging taste, test of faith that would reveal his ultimate love and true priorities. And we turn to verse 1 of chapter 22 in Genesis. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to Abraham, he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. 
I would imagine that such words make even the most devout of followers of Christ almost cringe today. As we think about today's culture, we are often told to look inwardly within ourselves to discover our identity and significance in this world. It's by looking inside of ourselves and discovering who we are that we find meaning and happiness in life. But the scriptures are clear that it is when we look outside of ourselves to Christ that we experience true freedom and purpose in life. Not only temporarily, but eternally. We die to our old self. And invite God, the Holy Spirit, to transform us from the inside out. Until the day he returns and perfects that transformation in us as well as all of creation. That's why you find in the outline in the bulletin, it is when we lose ourself, we find God. And I would add to that, true joy. It is when we lose L-O-S-E, that's our acronym, ourself, that we find God. Think about Abraham here. What's the first thing we notice? When God calls his name, he immediately says, here I am. I don't want to miss this simple observation. God only calls his name one time. Think about it, parents, if you can imagine a home when you call out your child's name one time, and immediately the response is, here I am, or better yet, let's take it up a notch, or you call out for your spouse, (laughs) and immediately you hear, no matter what they're caught up in, no matter what they're doing, they drop everything, turn the TV off, whatever, Here I am, honey. There's a lot of laughter. I don't understand why. Because it doesn't really happen that much. If your home is is like mine, we can all fall into this pattern every once in a while where we could be standing just a mere few feet away from our child or spouse who's so enthralled in the TV or their phone or whatever. It could be anything. And you're talking to them. And they're totally oblivious that you're even talking to them. I've been on both ends of that. (laughs) But sometimes, even though while we're so enthralled, there are times, however, that it is selective hearing that is at work. Sometimes our voices are heard, The choice is just not made to immediately say, here I am, at that point. As I thought about this, when it comes to our relationship with God, we're often like that. We're either distracted and oblivious to what God is saying and doing because we are so wrapped up in all this stuff, or we choose to have selective hearing. Either way, we allow God's voice to be drowned out, if that's the case, by the things of this world. But if we wish to answer the call of God, we must first, this is the L in the outline, listen to God. These are not rocket science points this morning, by the way. Listen to God. We don't know what was going on in Abraham's life at this time, but we do know that he stopped whatever he was doing and listened. He wasn't so preoccupied by other people, places, or things that he wasn't willing to stop and give God his undivided attention at that moment. You know, in order to truly listen to God or anybody else for that matter, genuinely listen, not just going through the motions of listening, but genuinely listening, You've got to be, first of all, available, and you've got to be attentive. Both must be present. We need to make ourselves available to God. That is, we need to make ourselves accessible to Him. It's hard to communicate to somebody if they can't make time for you. 
God should be able to get in touch with us whenever he wishes to speak to us. Why? Because he is God. And he shouldn't get a busy signal or voicemail or one of those messages that you get when somebody's turning their phone off or they're off the grid. We're sorry. The person you're trying to reach is unavailable. Please hang up and try again later. Often the reason God seems so silent, I think, at some times, is because we're not giving him our full attention. We're distracted. And that's why it's so important to remain available and attentive through the means to the mean, through the means that he often chooses to communicate. And it's important that we remain connected to him as individuals and as a church. One of these primary means is through his word. We're not going to cover them all this morning, but two of the main primary ones. One's his word, the Bible. I can't tell you the number of times that I've been reading a passage of scripture and the words on the page leap directly into my heart if God speaks directly to me. At times he has given me words of encouragement. At times he has given me words of correction. <laughs> At other times, his message has come to me loud and clear and still others just kind of gently speaking to me generally for that day. He has also spoken to me through so many sermons. Yes, I do too listen to my sermons. I usually listen to a sermon almost every Sunday before coming here so that I too am being spiritually fed. He spoke to me through sermons, Bible studies, and discussions with my fellow Christians and others. Do we make time to be attentive and available to God as he speaks to us through his word? Secondly, two most basic ways he communicates through prayer. Through prayer. Prayer is meant to be so much more than a list of wants and needs. You know, God's not a genie where we give him all our wishes. He desires to relate to us. A relationship goes both ways. Henry Blackaby, the author of Experience in God, a study many of you have done here, he said, Prayer is a relationship, not just a religious activity. Prayer is designed more to adjust you to God than to adjust God to you. When Henry's son, oldest son Richard, was getting ready to turn six, Henry decided that he was old enough to have a bicycle. So he shopped around, found, and bought a blue Schwinn bicycle. And then he hid it in the garage. Then Henry was faced with the task of, Okay, now i got to convince my son that he wants a Blue Schwinn bicycle for his birthday. And so in the months leading up to that, he kept investing and feeding that into his son a little bit until, lo and behold, when his birthday arrived, guess what? Richard wanted a Blue Schwinn bicycle, and what happened? He got one. That's a picture of how prayer works. When we pray in Jesus' name, I don't pray, dear God, please give me a Lamborghini. In Jesus' name, amen, and expect it. That's not what it's talking about. When we pray in Jesus' name, it implies conforming to God's will. And guess what? When we do that, we wind up wanting a blue Schwinn bicycle. God has a lot of great things prepared for us. If we would just communicate with him through prayer. Prayer is ultimately about us conforming to God and his agenda rather than us trying to conform him to ours. He wants to be a part of the planning process, if you will. When we have our dreams, do we say, Lord, 
Is my dream your dream? It seems that most keep their prayer lives to themselves. But Acts chapter 2 makes it clear that early church, they were devoted to many things. And one of them was praying together. Praying together. Among other things. Corporate prayer has a way of engaging God in a way that, a unique way that helps us to focus and encourage and unite together as we praise and seek Him. And we do have a small group that meets together for prayer here at our church. Tanya Yates would love to talk to you. Amanda's here this morning. Tanya's not here today, but or I could talk to you. We'd love to have you join us. But I ask, do we make time to be available and attentive to God in prayer? If anybody thinks that prayer is not important, that it's all about all that we do, look at what happened in the scriptures when things were done apart from prayer. Think about the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. Was prayer critical there? You look throughout the Old Testament, you see numerous examples there. Abraham was listening to God. And what God said couldn't have been more crystal clear. Take your son, your only son, not Ishmael, not the one you had through your servant Hagar because you tried to rush things. I'm talking about Isaac, the son I promised you, the son through whom I will bless the world and give you numerous descendants, the son whom you love and hold near and dear to your heart. Abraham, I want you to offer him as a sacrifice to me. Does that not make you cringe thinking about it? We can only imagine what Abraham must have been thinking. With all the thoughts that were bound to be racing through Abraham's mind, how would he respond? How would we respond? Which leads right into point two. Rocket science point number two. Obey God. Obey God. Look at verse three. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Now, let's, let's slow down and let's pause for some observations here. Because oftentimes when you rush through Scripture, you get an impression if you don't take time to reflect on it that may or may not be accurate. What time did Abraham get up in the day? Early. Early in the morning. What did he do when he got up early in the morning? He saddled his donkey and cut his own wood for the burnt offering. What in the world? When you have been given a command to do something as hard as this is, would possess a guy to get up early in the morning to saddle up his donkey and cut his own wood. Some might say that he was so faithfully and ready to obey God that he wanted to get an early start. You can almost picture him like one of the seven dwarfs. Hi ho, hi ho, it's off to kill my son, I go. As if you're thinking along that way. They might point to Hebrews 11 and say, since Abraham figured God could raise Isaac back from the dead, he eagerly proceeded to obey him without hesitation. But in case you can't tell, I don't really buy that. 
We've got to remember that the men and the women in the Bible were every bit as human as we are. Why would we get up early the next morning after being asked by God to sacrifice our only begotten, beloved Son in the hopes, in whom our hopes and dreams rested? Why would we get up early? You ever had a night before something really hard where you just couldn't sleep? Have you ever been under so much stress that you just couldn't sleep well? If you were an old rich guy, by the way, like Abraham, with lots of servants who could saddle his donkey and cut his wood for him, why would we do it ourselves? Have you ever been under so much pressure that you just had to go out and do something to expend some energy, whether it was through hard labor, yard work, or just a hard workout just to help try and take your mind off of things and release some of the stress or help you try to think it through. I wonder if that might be happening here. Something else to think of. What sense does it make to saddle up your donkey and then say, oh, by the way, oh, I need to go cut some wood right now. Wouldn't you cut up your wood for the haul and get it ready before you saddled up the donkey normally? I would think. There may be something to this, may not be. But I got to thinking, you know, have you ever been under so much pressure that you weren't thinking straight? I remember the day that uh, Emma was born because we didn't intend to have Emma that day. When I got up that morning, me and my mom and dad were getting ready to start painting her bedroom. Emma came very early, by the way. And so we're sitting there, and I get the call from Wendy. Hey, they're getting ready to have the baby right now, so I'm on my way from Mebbin to Durham. Boom, and the Durham Regional right then and there. I think I'm thinking clearly. I really do. Wendy looks at me before they bring him out. No one finds out whether this is a boy or girl before I do. Okay, no problem. Boom, they invite me in when they're doing the C-section. I go in there, oh, out comes Emma. I'm so excited. I burst through the double doors and I go back outside. It's a girl! And that was a good stress. And then a minute later, I remembered my wife and the look on her face when she said, nobody finds out until I do. I said, y'all can't tell her. <laughs> That's good stress. But when things are happening, and I've, I've ministered to folks, and been ministered to by folks under these circumstances. When there's so much on your plate, you can't think straight. Perhaps that was going on. Or perhaps he saved the cutting for the wood. Maybe he was procrastinating to save the worst part for the last because of what that wood represented. Who knows? Whatever was going on in Abraham's mind, he sets out to obey God anyway apparently without hesitation, despite the sacrifice that God was calling him to. Sure, in Hebrews eleven nineteen, it tells us that Abraham reasoned through faith that God could raise Isaac back from the dead. But he still had to kill him first. We can't bear our children hurting, can we? If you love your child much less hurting them or killing them ourselves. Abraham was a great man of faith, but that doesn't mean he didn't have a lump in his throat and knots in his stomach through all of this. Sometimes trust and obedience to God will take us to places that we would rather not be and put us in positions where we must make difficult choices that we would rather not make. And that brings us right to point three, we sacrifice for God. There's no way to follow Christ without sacrifice, without our schedules occasionally being interrupted, without it inconveniencing us, without it costing us. Moving on to verse 4 in our story, we read, On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in a distance. <laughs> Three days? Most of us, when we're, the hardest point in most of our trials 
is the fact that we can't get it over with. We can't get to that surgery fast enough, and yet we got to wait. We can't wait for that test result, but we got to wait. Can you imagine what was going through Abraham's mind all three days, long days for him in that journey? Then in verse 5, he said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, I mean, said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Are you putting yourself in Abraham's shoes through all this? Can you imagine what must have been going through his mind in having his own son carry the wood on which he would be offered? Can you imagine what it must have been like to carry the fire and the knife that you would use to sacrifice him? Can you imagine what went through Abraham's mind when Isaac asked him, Hey, Dad, where's the, the lamb for the burnt offering? How would you have answered that one? Verse 8, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. <laughs> I can't help but to think he was thinking in his mind, I hope. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. I can't help but to wonder, did Isaac let Abraham tie him up or did Abraham somehow tie him up in his sleep? How'd that go down? Did Isaac go quietly and willingly to the altar, or did he look up at his dad crying out, Dad, what are you doing? It's not spelled out for us. As I think about this, I can't help but ask, is it at least possible if God would ask Abraham to get this far to where he is, would he not ask us to make sacrifices? To give up someone or something that we hold near and dear. Maybe God is calling us to sacrifice an unhealthy relationship to which we're still clinging. Maybe God wants us to let go of a dream or goal that keeps us, our spouse, or our children from knowing him more. Maybe God is calling us to surrender the bitterness, selfishness, or pride that is destroying our marriage and our home. Maybe God wants us to give up our comfortable and pleasure-driven lifestyle that keeps us distracted conveniently as we look at the world around us and hinders us from growing spiritually. Maybe God wants us to sacrifice those things that rival him for our affection. What might God be calling us to sacrifice this morning? What might be in the way? And prevent us from experiencing him in our lives, in our homes, in our churches, and in our world. And that brings us right into the last point. If we listen to God, obey God, and sacrifice for God, we will experience God. He will show himself to be more than faithful. As he does for Abraham. Verse 11. Keep in mind at this point, Abraham has the knife. It's up in the air. It's getting ready to go down. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven... 
Abraham, Abraham. But he didn't have any problem listening then. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. He said. Perhaps he broke down in tears of joy and relief. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. I bet that knife never fell out of the person's hand any quicker than it did right then. And just as a quick note right here, I know this is a difficult scripture. God, I'm sure that God never had any intentions of him following through on this. That was not ultimately a part of the text. We read throughout the rest of Scripture that God forbade child sacrifice. That was not the intention here. The intention here was a difficult test to reveal Abraham's true love and priorities. You know how you kind of recognize true love and priorities as I look in my own life? Find out or discover what happens in your heart when God takes them away. God's not your true priority, guess how you're going to respond? <laughs> it's not going to be pretty. If we want to experience God in true fulfillment in life that surpasses the rat race and the chaos, we must first lose ourselves in order to gain the self that God desires for us to experience. And that can't be experienced apart from Him. And when God reveals Himself, we experience Him, His peace, His provision, His power, and His promises. Finishing up in verses 13 through 14, Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. We too can experience God as the Lord who provides in more ways than we could ever begin to imagine. As I look at this story, I'm reminded of the one who was called the Lamb of God. He was the ram in the thicket. The Bible tells us we have all fallen short of glory of, God, glory of God. We are all sinners, and the wages of sin is death. We were Isaac laying on that altar. But God sent a lamb, a ram in the thicket to be offered in our place. But it just so happens that that lamb also happened to be his son, his only son, his beloved son, in whom all of his promises for his people rested. All of his hopes are in his son. And his son carried the own wood for his offering as he carried his cross to Calvary where he willingly allowed himself to die in our place so that we might experience abundant eternal life that is more than the exact opposite of what we have going on around us in this world today. This world makes so many daggum promises that are so empty and so hollow. And it will not satisfy. It is not the living water that you will receive that, from which you will never thirst again. Jesus is the living water. And he desires for us to drink and to drink more. He doesn't want us just a little sip here and there. He wants us to hydrate. 
in a bunch. The question is, do we want to go? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much that you have poured out your son for our sake. And we pray, Lord, that through his sacrifice, we can draw near to you. That through his resurrection, we can find hope to cling to you. Help us, Lord, as we navigate this world, for we know it is not easy. I, too, get distracted and deceived at times. And I pray that in your grace, you will keep me focused. Because the last thing I want to do is stand before you, and one day you say, man, Richard, you didn't do or say exactly what I wanted you to. Help us, Lord, to drink from your pure, living water so that we might experience your glory, not only here in the present, but throughout all of eternity. We look forward to the day of your return, but until then, you have called us to expand your kingdom here on this earth, in our hearts, in our homes, in our church, and in our world. Help us to be attentive and available to do it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.